Compared to anti-venom, carnages aren't so bad. Ah, anti-venom saved me? Welcome back to Marvelous Videos. I'm Rylan. Most of us are familiar with Venom, the inky black symbiote that has extensively served as a prominent Spider-Man villain. However, how many of us actually know about Anti-Venom? Anti-Venom is a symbiote like Venom and was developed by Dan Slott and John Romita Jr., originally appearing in The Amazing Spider-Man number 569 in August of 2008. Anti-Venom isn't technically a relative or descendant of Venom, unlike the majority of the other symbiotes that Marvel readers have grown accustomed to throughout the course of the publication history. Rather, he has instead revealed himself to be a modified form of the original symbiote. Despite the fact that Anti-Venom has been around in the comics for as long as his counterpart, he shares a convoluted past with the original symbiote. Since Anti-Venom is a symbiote, over the years, a handful of characters have gone by the name of Anti-Venom, and each one has had an impact on the symbiote's legacy. So, in today's episode, we will break down the origins and the legacy of Marvel's Anti-Venom. But before we get into our explanation, though, we do have one very small request. If you like our content, then please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is just one small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thanks. Now, let's begin. Venom! No! Exploring the comic book origins of Anti-Venom. Anti-Venom first appears in the Spider-Man story arc, New Ways to Die, which is a six-issue Spider-Man storyline written by Dan Slott with art by John Romita Jr. His first origin story is detailed in this fast-paced narrative, which features notorious Spider-Man foes like Venom and the Green Goblin. The story has various facets to it. The city has its mayoral elections coming soon, and a low-key war has broken out between the two campaigning nominees, Bill Hollister and Randall Crown. While Hollister is straightforward, honest, and a charitable candidate, Crown, on the other hand, is a scheming businessman with ties to the Green Goblin, Norman Osborn. In light of this power struggle, the Daily Bugle has been taken over by a man named Dexter Bennett, who has fired Peter Parker, putting him out of work and making the paper one giant PR house for Randall Crown. This is also the time when Spider-Man has been labeled by the paper as being a serial killer, and thus, his popularity is at an all-time low. In the background of these happenings, Norman Osborn arrives back in the city, and his team, called the Thunderbolts, consisting of Songbird, Bullseye, Radioactive Man, and Venom all strike a deal with Crown and sets off on his mission to destroy the Web Slinger once and for all. Spider-Man faces off against a villain known as Menace, but in the ensuing fight, he blows up a building before running away. As the chaos unfolds, Spider-Man observes a large number of employees leaving the building, as well as rows of manually operated machinery. He snaps images of these discoveries and delivers them to another paper known as the Frontline's Office. Looking at the pictures, the staff comes to the conclusion that Randall Crown, a mayoral contender, was using the building as an illegal sweatshop. They quickly realize that this is probably one of the biggest stories that could decide the outcome of the elections, and thus runs with it. Crown then speaks with Norman Osborn, following the publication of an article on the scandal in Frontline. He requests Osborn's support and the presence of his team in the city. Further, the Daily Bugle, having been taken over by Bennett, goes into damage control mode, and Dexter Bennett instructs reporter Betty Brandt to look into a man called Martin Lee in order to refuse Frontline's peace. Following orders, she visits the Feast Center, a homeless shelter and food kitchen, to interview Lee. However, seeing Eddie Brock, or swell Venom, surprises her. It is during this time that we are given a glimpse into Eddie Brock's backstory. Brock used to be the human host for the Venom symbiote. However, he was not in control of whatever he did as Venom, and when the symbiote left his body, all he could do was ask for forgiveness and repent for his crimes. He became religious and used to pray in the church, and it was during one such prayer that Mr. Lee, the alter ego of Mr. Negative, found Eddie and offered him a job at the Feast Center, since he was the founder. Eddie readily accepted the job, since he wanted to spend the rest of his days helping and being of service to people. Mr. Lee helped exonerate him for all of his crimes he committed as Venom. By taking the assistance of a lawyer friend of his, they got Eddie a hearing in court, where it was proved that Eddie was not in control of his body or his mind, and thus none of his actions or crimes he had committed was what he himself had wanted to do during his time as Venom. However, even though he had managed to turn his life around, the Venom symbiote still haunted him. In fact, even after after the symbiote had left his body, traces of it still remained, which caused cancer in his body. The dying man sought treatment, but the situation was extremely bleak since the cancer was in its last stages. He was rejected from clinical trials for a new cancer drug that Oscorp was conducting, and he thought he was going to die. However, one day at a routine checkup, he was informed by his doctor that somehow, by some sort of miracle, he was cured of his cancer entirely. And what he didn't know was that Mr. Lee was actually Mr. Negative, and that he had used his superpowers to cure Eddie of his
his cancer completely, allowing Eddie another chance at life. During this time, something unique happened, unbeknownst to both of them. In an attempt to cure Eddie, Lee unintentionally mixed the Venom symbiote remains in Eddie's circulation with his power and fused them to his white blood cells. This resulted in a new genetic composition for Eddie, and when Venom finally came back, he spotted his old host and lunged towards Eddie in an attempt to bond with him once again. This attempt resulted in the creation of a new hybrid symbiote, the Anti-Venom. This happened because Eddie's fused white blood cells fought off Venom's new symbiote cells, leading to the creation of a new hybrid symbiote that was the cure to Venom. Eddie then turned into the antithesis of his arch nemesis. He became what he always wanted to be, the cure to all Venom's darkness. The rest of the storyline features the new Anti-Venom fighting off Venom, and even attempting to cure Spider-Man once he realizes that Spider-Man has radiation toxin in his veins. What he doesn't realize is that it's the very toxin that grants Spider-Man his superpowers, and thus the effort weakens the superhero. However, he proves to be integral in the fight against the Thunderbolts, even succeeding in stripping off the Venom symbiote completely from its host, Mac Gargan. However, the traces of the anti-Venom symbiote that were left on Gargan during their epic battle led to the creation of another major superpowered version of Venom, Scorpion, complete with a tail ending in a scorpion stinger. Though, anti-Venom didn't really last very long, since sometime later, during the Spider Island event, Eddie gave up his anti-Venom symbiote to help people recover from the Spider Queen spider virus the other major hosts of Anti-Venom. In the same way that many have hosted the Venom symbiote in their bodies, the Anti-Venom symbiote is no different. The second Anti-Venom appears after Eddie and is seen in the Axis plotline, wherein a new Anti-Venom could be seen amongst the new heroes gathered by Roderick Kingsley, aka the original Hobgoblin, in his self-help seminar. Kingsley had given all the new heroes existing heroic personas that were no longer in use. Whether the new Anti-Venom seen here was a symbiote or merely a man in a suit to resemble the previous Anti-Venom symbiote, symbiote was not exactly made clear in the story. The character's speech bubble, however, was noticeably stylized to imply a distortion of the character's voice, akin to Eddie Brock's speaking style when he was bonded with the Anti-Venom symbiote. The third person to host the Anti-Venom symbiote was Flash Thompson. During the Spider Island incident, Eddie Brock was compelled to surrender the Anti-Venom symbiote in order to develop a treatment. Flash Thompson was later exposed to part of the Anti-Venom serum in Venom Inc. Since some of the serum had been salvaged under the Spider Island event, Flash was able to become a Agent Anti-Venom, thanks to the serum's interaction with the Venom symbiote in his blood. In contrast to his first role as Agent Venom, Flash Thompson didn't really spend too much time as Agent Anti-Venom. Norman Osborn transformed into the Red Goblin during the Go Down Swinging plotline after joining forces with the Carnage symbiote. He launched a vicious attack on Spider-Man that was directed at his family. Fortunately, Agent Anti-Venom was able to shield Spider-Man's dearest friends and allies with his healing touch, but it left the hero open to attacks. Flash Thompson was fatally injured by the Red Goblin and the anti-venom symbiote was unable to heal him. Flash Thompson died while defending others, and it appears that it also spelled the end for the anti-venom symbiote. Later, during the King in Black event, Flash Thompson's physical body was revived when his new anti-venom codex seized control of the Grendel symbiote dragon. In order to become Carnage's new arch enemy, he once more changed into Agent Anti-Venom. In the Extreme Carnage event, Agent Anti-Venom teamed up with the Silence and Toxin to battle Carnage's hive mind, but this was not the only squad he joined following his return. Thompson also joined the new incarnation of the Savage Avengers, featuring Conan the Barbarian, Cloak and Dagger, Weapon H Deathlock, and the Black Knight. Last but not least, Black Cat became a version of Anti-Venom. Well, in a way. Over the years, Dr. Stevens of Alchemex collaborated extensively with Eddie Brock and the Venom symbiote. Additionally, he participated in the Sleeper symbiote's early development and the King and in Black invasion defense efforts against the Null invasion. In order to assist the heroes during the symbiote onslaught, Stevens merged several components of his symbiote expertise. Stevens enhanced heroes like Black Cat, using his study on Weapon V's Sim Soldier suits and a concoction that he made from the Anti-Venom symbiote. He built a test version of Black Cat's Anti-Venom battle suit, which she then used to save Doctor Strange from Null. Black Cat was shielded from the symbiotes by the Anti-Venom battle suit, but it was quite flimsy and quickly disintegrated. You've got to fight off the Anti-Venom! <laughs> <sighs> <sighs> Anti-Venom featured in crucial roles in Ultimate Spider-Man. Matt Lanter provided the voice of the Anti-Venom symbiote in Disney XD's superhero animated television series Ultimate Spider-Man, which is based on the Spider-Man comics distributed by Marvel Comics. The Anti-Venom symbiote is developed by Dr. Octopus and Michael Morbius in the episode called The White Symbiote. In an effort to create a potential member of the former Hydra's supported Sinister Six, Dr. Octopus developed this new symbiote to be quick and effective, and also toxic to the original 
original version. Harry Osborn became the very first host of this artificially developed anti-venom symbiote during a battle in which he tried to support Spider-Man and Agent Venom against Doc Ock. Spider-Man and Iron Patriot were forced to use a positive iron inhibitor to stop anti-venom after he started attacking and was on the verge of killing Agent Venom. This left Harry unconscious and in a coma at the end of things. The anti-venom had a black and white face with orange eyes and an orange mouth. He had a black spider emblem on his white body. He also was huge and incredibly strong, being able to take on Agent Venom effortlessly. However, his story didn't end there. Further later, during the time that Carnage had infected the majority of the city, Harry was kept unconscious in his comatose state as the symbiote army invaded Oscorp. After they forced their way inside, Anti-Venom was restored, and he demonstrated his ability to rid the civilians of the Carnage symbiotes. The original Venom was subsequently discovered by him, and he made an effort to heal him as well. Spider-Man took note of this and lured Anti-Venom to the Carnage Hive by using Agent Venom as bait. After the commotion subsided, Peter assisted Harry in waking up so that he could regain control and break away from the symbiote. However, in order to save the city, Harry needed to regain command of the symbiote. Although, before the explosion, it's entirely plausible that he absorbed himself into Harry in a manner akin to how Carnage did with Mary Jane. Due to the toxic bond, as Dr. Octopus alluded to in this episode, this anti-venom had all the abilities of the original. He could also melt through the original symbiote. Internal body cleansing, however, was his most renowned ability, as seen in the series. Anti-venom could use antibodies made by the symbiote to forcefully cure a chemical from the person's body after detecting impurities such as poisons, narcotics, diseases, or any other harmful substances. When Spider-Man sought to destroy the remaining venom symbiote, this power almost completely cleansed him of the radiation in his blood. Radioactive Man likewise came dangerously close to being depowered in a similar way. As the Carnage symbiote struck New York and destroyed its numerous hosts, Anti-Venom awakened once again in the three-part episode called The Symbiote Saga. However, before Harry learned that Spider-Man was who he thought he was, the Anti-Venom symbiote was almost consumed by Carnage's heart. Anti-Venom then rebonded with Harry as he came to his senses and gave his life to rid New York of the Carnage infestation, although the Carnage Queen subsequently claimed its powers. I am he also appeared in an episode of Spider-Man. The Season 3 Maximum Venom episode titled Vengeance of Venom, which is the 55th episode in the Marvel Spider-Man series, featured the Anti-Venom symbiote. This version of the symbiote is produced when May Parker strikes Groot with a sonic weapon. This is done in response to Max Modell's idea to access the alien's pollination skills and hybridize it with the symbiote power in order to heal the hosts of the Clintar invading force. What made Anti-Venom so powerful? Anti-Venom is insanely powerful. Here is the symbiote's long list of powers. The Anti-Venom symbiote endows its host with superhuman power. Eddie Brock trained himself to lift 700 pounds before the symbiote was born. After Anti-Venom was created, Brock's enormous human strength was combined with more power, enabling Brock to lift more than 70 tons. And this is not even his actual limit, as his strength rises with his varied muscular mass. The body of Anti-Venom is additionally very resilient to physical harm. It can endure a attacks from both superhuman beings and high caliber bullets. The symbiote can absorb bullets from small arms firing conventional ammo when it is spread across Brock's body at a normal thickness. The symbiote also has the ability to replicate any types of clothes, blend in with its environment, and even imitate other humans in order to strengthen its attacks. Anti-Venom can also alter its matter to expand or grow its body. It's expanded its host's fist, for example, for slamming into Mac Gargan to increase the force of the strike. Anti-Venom also has the power to transform the hand of its host into various things like a blade or a shield. Anti-Venom is also able to endure dangerous conditions for extended periods of time, such as submersion in water or exposure to hazardous chemicals by filtering the air for its host. The symbiote can also mend wounds in the host more quickly than it's possible with typical human healing. Injuries and diseases like cancer that can't be treated by modern human medicine can be cured by the symbiote. Anti-Venom is considerably more advanced in this regard, and it can quickly recover from a shotgun gunshot to the head. Not only does it have the ability to heal itself and its host, but anti-venom also has the ability to detect foreign materials in the person's body. Symbiotes, radiation, drugs, infections, and other disorders fall within this category. Anti-venom can use antibodies made by the symbiote, can forcefully cure a substance from a person's blood or internal systems after detecting it. Eddie Brock notably utilizes this power to heal a teenage girl from a heroin addiction and to almost entirely destroy his former symbiote. This means that he is pretty much able to cure every human illness, including cancer. However, this power 
power can also be used to depower other heroes and villains. When trying to eliminate the last of the Venom symbiote, this power also completely cleanses Spider-Man of the radiation in his blood. It also almost completely strips Radioactive Man of his powers in a similar way. Similar to Spider-Man, Anti-Venom has an extrasensory talent known as a Spider-Sense, since the symbiote can perceive threats coming from all sides, providing Brock with plenty of response time. This reaction is not as complicated as Spider-Man's natural sense. However, because it detects danger faster than Spider-Man's spidey sense, and because Brock's reflexes are accelerated by the symbiote, they are also quicker than Spider-Man's. Additionally, because Spider-Man served as the Venom symbiote's initial host, Anti-Venom is able to avoid his spider sense as well, having all of Venom's powers. Anti-Venom is therefore a powerful foe to Spider-Man, because his strikes do not activate Spider-Man's spidey sense. Once again, similar to how Spider-Man can shoot webs, Anti-Venom can do the same. The substance the symbiote shoots appears to be made up of a resilient, malleable organic polymer fiber that regenerates quickly after shedding. Since the webbing itself was an extension of the physical manifestation of the symbiote suit, the one drawback to the power is if Anti-Venom uses too much of it, it would become invulnerable, because the symbiote is unable to restore its lost matter for a short time while depleted. In order to assault or entrap his adversaries, Brock uses the symbiote to create webbing and tentacles or tendrils. The Anti-Venom symbiote is also notably immune to the other symbiote sensitivities, such as fire and sonics. Anti-Venom is resistant to heat and flame. This includes defying the full force of a flamethrower attack from the Punisher, and withstanding a scorching radiation blast from Radioactive Man that was intended to paralyze Venom, if that symbiote ever got out of control. Anti-Venom demonstrates significant resistance to sonic assaults, in addition to immunity to fire and heat. It could, for instance, tolerate Songbird's sonic blast with little to no difficulty. Furthermore, another notable aspect of this symbiote is that it was not sentient. Venom, for example, was sentient and lingered in Eddie's mind even when the two were separated. However, Anti-Venom was not a sentient symbiote. Eddie was perfectly in control and aware of what he was doing as Anti-Venom. He also had complete free will to do whatever he wanted. What is the difference between Venom and Anti-Venom? There are some stark differences between the two symbiotes. Venom is notably all black in color, if we are to compare their physical appearances, while Anti-Venom, naturally being the antithesis to Venom, is predominantly white in color. Appearances aside, one of the main differences lies in the fact that Anti-Venom is not a sentient symbiote, and thus doesn't exactly take over the host's mind. It doesn't make the host do anything, and the host has complete control over their actions as Anti-Venom. Eddie Brock compares the two when he first becomes Anti-Venom, and we learn how much he hated being Venom's host. He never wanted to cause all that carnage and chaos. This nature also allows the anti-Venom symbiote to be used for good, since the host is not forced to commit crimes and cause chaos. Further, the anti-Venom symbiote has the unique ability to cure illnesses and diseases, making it essentially a force for good in the hands of the reformed Eddie Brock. This ability to cleanse people's bodies of impurities further grants anti-Venom a unique power to contrast to his counterpart, Venom. He is able to dissolve and kill other symbiotes if he is able to come into physical contact with them. Since the symbiotes are technically impurities in the bodies of their hosts, its cleansing powers work on them as well. Essentially, Anti-Venom possesses all of Venom's abilities in addition to the special one to cleanse individuals, which also renders the other symbiotes inert and fatal upon physical contact with it. We haven't seen much of Anti-Venom in comparison to its evil counterpart, but that doesn't mean that Anti-Venom is any less cool. It's quite obvious that Anti-Venom is just as powerful as Venom, if not more so, and it could be quite cool to see this particular symbiote on the big screen. What are your thoughts about Anti-Venom? Are you a fan of this symbiote? Let us know in the comments section below. And if you enjoyed today's episode, don't forget to leave us a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Until next time, have a good one and be safe.